two astronauts stranded in space. What's up with that? And while Boeing Starliner did successfully deliver its two astronauts, their mission just got a whole lot longer. What started as an eight-day expedition has turned to a rescue mission. NASA's announced this morning two American astronauts will have to wait another six months to come home after being left stranded on the International Space Station. When I heard about this dilemma, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm an old man now, so I've been around many, many decades. I try to put the potential catastrophe in context. Okay, that's what you do when you get older. You bring not knowledge to a thought, but wisdom. So let me go back in time. When I go back 60 years to the Apollo era, I'm reminded there was a film, came out in 1969. The same year we landed on the moon. It was called Maroon. Astronauts marooned in space with no hope of being rescued. It had major stars. It had Gregory Peck, it had Gene Hackman. I remember watching that film in real time and being very concerned for the astronauts because they were running out of oxygen, right? That's kind of important thing you need to survive. They're in a space capsule, which is not very large. And I don't remember why they couldn't come out of orbit. That's not what I remember. What I remembered was the effort put forth by NASA and the public down on Earth to rescue them. But here was a problem. In the time we needed to rescue them so that they wouldn't suffocate from the absence of oxygen, a hurricane was moving across Cape Canaveral. So they find out that the duration of the hurricane, because you're not gonna launch during a hurricane, then you'd kill the astronauts going up to try to save them. So that you'd be worse, all right? There'd be more deaths. And then someone realized that the eye of the hurricane was gonna move across the launch pad. The eye of the hurricane is quiet. Brilliant. So they set the launch time to match the moment that the eye of the hurricane passed over the launch pad. That's when they launched. Brilliant storytelling, brilliant space drama. And you see that the, it comes up through the eye of the hurricane and they go rescue the astronauts who would have otherwise died. So uh, my vocabulary, my sense of danger, my understanding, what shaped me as a space enthusiast and a space realist were not only the high dramas of stories depicted at the time, but the real drama of real astronauts whose life was put at risk. Uh, Apollo 13, uh, we've all seen that film and we know the story. That Apollo mission never landed on the moon, though it had intended to do so. A lot of uh, ingenious thinking had to go to keep them alive. Right? There was a tank that had turned and it exploded and the oxygen supply was low. A, a lot of repeated issues related to their survival played out in Apollo 13. And I then catch a headline, two astronauts stranded in space. And then I thought to myself, well, are they in a capsule? No, where are they? Oh, they're in the space station. They're in the space station. Okay, well, why are they stranded? Oh, the vehicle that they took to get up there has attitude adjustment problems. Nothing emotional. <laughs> There's some jets necessary to properly align a ship, to dock, to make micro maneuvers that you need to do to make precision movement with the craft. This was the first out test of Boeing Starliner. Let us remind ourselves that the first time you do something with a new piece of hardware, there's probably gonna be problems with it. Probably. That's how this works. That's how all frontiers are breached. You do the best you can and you realize, oh my gosh, there's something I had not foreseen. There's something I had not considered. Happens all the time. In fact, the very Apollo era were increments. We remember Neil Armstrong, yes, but did you know that Apollo 8 went to the moon and came back, didn't land? So it, it figured that out. 
Then Apollo 9 didn't go to the moon at all. It did some maneuvers in orbit just to make sure docking and other tactics would work. And then Apollo 10 deployed the lander, the lunar excursion module. It lowered itself to the moon, stopped, and then went back up to the command module without actually touching the moon. They wanted to test that. Come Apollo 11, every incremental bit of that trip had already been tested and the bugs were worked out. So that on Apollo 11, that their increment was not, oh my gosh, we went to the moon for the first time. No, it's we've been to the moon several times. We've even come close to the surface and now you're gonna go all the way to the surface. Yes, that's how exploration works. That's how discovery works. So the fact that there are problems with the Starliner, that I'm not, I didn't lose sleep over that. Okay, I'm glad the astronauts were safe docking with the space station. Back to their safety. So my two marooned astronauts in this 1969 film were in a small capsule running out of oxygen. Where are our two stranded astronauts? In the International Space Station. Do you know how big the space station is? In total, with solar panels included, it's the size of a football field. Whereas these capsules, are the size of the love seat in your living room. Now, of course, the space station is composed of modules. How big are the modules? Well, it's a volume because you're just floating around, so it doesn't make sense to think of it in square footage. But let's try to do that. Let's take a cut through the module. What's that area? It's about 400 square feet. Sounds small until you look at the real estate listings of Manhattan for studio apartments. 400 square feet, plenty of people are living in 400 square feet right here in Manhattan. So that's not cramped quarters in the total range of possible cramped quarters you can think up. All right, what else is true? Oh, there's a half dozen other astronauts already there in the space station. So are they marooned and stranded? Are they alone? No, there's other people they can go play with, okay? And they got food. Now, I have not checked the food supply in the pantry of the space station. I do know that different modules that correspond with the different nationalities, because it is an international space station, different modules stock different types of food. And that food tends to be regional to the tastes of the astronauts visiting. So I can't imagine that the American module is gonna run out of food, but if they did, then they, float over to the next module and eat some European food or some Japanese food or some, some other food. Why not? I'm sure the other astronauts will share their food. Keep in mind, every time a ship docks with the International Space Station, every time a ship docks, there are supplies that come on board. Space is routine right now. It's not 1969 anymore. So I'm reading this story and the press is making a big deal of it. I just could not make as big a deal of it as the press was. I just couldn't. And who are the astronauts? We have uh, Sunita Williams and uh, uh, Butch Wilmore. These are two astronauts that have already spent a lot of time in orbit on previous missions. This is not their first rodeo. Butch Wilmore, he spent about, about nine months in orbit, something like that, in a, in a collective total time he's been in space. Sunita Williams has been up for more than a year in total time logged in space. And so this is just another mission they're on. Another mission. Oh, we can't bring you back in a week or 10 days or a couple of weeks. No, you have to stay up there longer. Okay. We got to figure out how to bring you down. Okay. Call me when you got an answer. NASA has decided they're gonna send the Boeing Starliner back down to Earth. Boeing will check it out, have a look at it, do what they need to do. And SpaceX is gonna come send uh, their Crew Dragon up with two astronauts in two empty seats. They're gonna come dock into that same docking collar and then rescue the astronauts. But it's not immediate. They have to wait for the scheduling and for the ship to get ready. Oh, by the way, that's kind of interesting. We're living in our own future where one kind of rocket wasn't working, so you go to another rocket. So I thought, yeah, this is how it's supposed to happen. This is what, I expect, and yes, you wanna err on the side of caution. So maybe if they were, you know, cowboys, you know, they could have just taken the Starliner back, risking it, but 
If you don't need to risk it, then you don't. Think about it. What are our greatest achievements that we remember, that we tell stories about? It's not where everything goes right. Curiously, those are the least interesting stories to tell. It's where something goes wrong and we use human ingenuity to figure out how to solve the problem. And in the case of space, that human ingenuity lives in the mind and creativity of engineers especially, and occasionally scientists. You know another way to look at this drama as it unfolds? If I were one of those two astronauts, Sunita or Butch, and I get the call from NASA, we can't take you down on the Boeing Starliner, you gotta wait six months for a different vessel to rescue you. My reaction would be, cool. I get to spend more time in space. There are people who spend millions of dollars to gain access to space. Millions. Buying a seat to get put on a rocket. Now we have two astronauts who are being forced to spend more time in space. They're astronauts. I assure you, they love space. Sunita Williams, Butch Wilmore, will welcome you back to Earth when you come. As you may know, we recently posted a video in response to Terence Howard's appearance on Joe Rogan's podcast where he discussed his interpretation of maths. And key points to take away from that are, one, we should critically analyse all the information we come across, and two, be open to our views being challenged. Like this new study on dark matter being debunked, for example, it suggests the universe's expansion is not driven by dark energy, but by weakening forces of nature. Now, when it comes to new theories that challenge our accepted understanding of space, it's important to see how different scientific sources are interpreting these new findings to fully understand it. Luckily, Ground News makes this much easier to do. With the Vantage Plan, you get access to original research, plus every article covering it and even insight on each news publication's political bias and credibility context that could influence their reporting. Their founder and former NASA engineer also designed their Blind Spot feed, which uses patented technology to help us easily step out of our echo chambers and see important news stories we might have otherwise missed. Exposing yourself to diverse perspectives helps ensure that you don't just know enough about an issue to think you're right, but you actually know enough to recognize when you might be wrong. So, avoid the Dunning-Kruger effect, get ground news, and critically analyze the information you consume, all for $5 a month if you use our link or scan the QR code. You're saving 40% on the same unlimited access Vantage plan you use with the discount. We really can't recommend ground news and their commitment to rigorous analysis and combating misinformation enough. <laughs> <laughs>